nobody's paying attention to you, Brian. Everybody's leaving anyway. Uh, <laughs> Lock the doors. Lock the door. Don't let anybody out. Are we, are we live now? Uh, all right, we're live. Okay. All right, welcome to those who have joined us online. Uh, we're glad that you're with us as well. I do want to uh, share a little bit about the Life School Golf Tournament. It's uh, coming up this coming Friday, so it's coming right upon us. Uh, I just checked on uh, our Donor Rise website uh, this morning, and it's that we're at about 23,000 that have been uh, entered into the uh, website uh, information. Uh, but I want to, our goal is 60,000, and I really do, am praying that we can we can reach that goal. We certainly need to, uh, to, to accomplish what God has put in our hearts uh, to do that. So anyway, I want to challenge everybody uh, to, uh, to make a donation, to pray about what, would God, what God would have you to, to give to this. You know, I was just thinking as, uh, during the worship that uh, this, for Restoration Life, this is our mission assignment. Um, there's no way, I mean, it goes, I won't take the time to go through it, but it, uh, it goes back to 1983 where Donna and I were called to foreign missions and we, we felt specifically called to Africa. And, you know, the whole thing, the, the way the journey was is way too complicated to explain right now. But it's, this is, only God could have accomplished what, he's done so far. I mean, the, you know, where the, the numbers of pastors that, that lo the Lord is touching through this, it's only God. And it's our, our, we're, we're the stewards of this, you know, we're the stewards of this. And I know, you know, this is the 13th year of, uh, having the golf tournament and giving, and it seems like October's come around quicker and quicker than they used to. It seemed like about every six months, but uh, and I know it's a challenge, uh, but in terms of giving, just let's be obedient uh, to the Lord. Uh, you know, one thing about the Ruth thing that I was talking about, Naomi means pleasant, and she's a picture of the Holy Spirit. Uh, you know, as we follow the Lord, he will lead us to a pleasant ending. Amen. Because she right got married to a kinsman redeemer. So let's be obedient in giving. Uh, you know, if you've got uh, gift cards or whatever for the prizes, Judy's right there to give them uh, to her. And um, just if if you have a whole sponsor, I've got to have, if it's a new one where we have to make a sign, I've got to know it by uh, today or early in the morning, one or the other, to get it, the, the signs printed in time. So anyway, let's all give. Let's all uh, ask others to, to give and, uh, uh, you know, do what uh, we can to, to make this a reality. Amen. amen. Can I hear a resounding amen? Amen. 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 All right. Also add in there if you're watching us online I would really encourage you to give as well is that we don't just keep the things we're receiving that we're hearing to ourselves but we uh, we give into this ministry to help share it with others every every single penny that comes into life school goes directly to missions we don't take a dime out of for anything of us so you're giving straight to pastors in Africa who will be able to be trained and equipped. So anyway, just wanted to say that. But okay, so we're going to start. We're we're in uh, session three of our indwelling life class, and the the title of this session is One Spirit with Christ. And I want to begin this message by looking at Second Timothy chapter three verse seven because when our per, some people who we have a prayer team who prays for our services and one of the intercessors was quick in this scripture verse that i believe is appropriate for our church it's appropriate for those who are listening online i want to share this and explain uh this verse of scripture but paul was talking and if you look in the context of what paul was saying uh, paul was specifically looking at the end of the age the end times and in verse 7 he describes this um, phenomenon that, that is very common in the church, especially in America, where we are, 
We are the byproducts of the age of enlightenment and the age of reason, and we are the Greek mindset that has come into the church where we want to amass as much knowledge as we can get in our heads and think it's the same thing as having it in our heart. And Paul is writing, and he's talks, talks, talking about people who were hearing his message, and he was talking about, and he says that they're always learning. You could say they're always hearing. They're always getting knowledge. They're always learning. I would say even in this age we live in with YouTube and books and all that we have access to now, is how very common this is for us that we're always learning, and then he says, but here's the, the real kicker, is we're never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, if you just read that without really diving into the Greek, you're, it may not mean as much as I'm about to explain, because what this word means, uh, this word knowledge means, it means true, precise, correct, full knowledge that comes out of relational experience. See, we, we often make the mistake, and I hit on this last, last Sunday, is we often make the mistake that because I know something in my head, it's the same thing of having that revelation in my heart. And it's, it is vastly different. It's, 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 it's like what Jesus said, they're always hearing, but they're not hearing they're always seeing, but they're not seeing. Yet because they have the knowledge in their head that we can easily be deceived into thinking because I know something mentally, I have the experience of it here in my heart, in my spirit. And it's a great deception. It is a great deception. It is a great deception of the enemy. It's the very ploy of the enemy that goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. This is basically the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, is that you would eat knowledge and feed on knowledge. And this can be applied to Scripture. It can be applied to the things of God, as you would feed on knowledge that would go to the soul, to the mind, and yet be devoid of the relational experience that brings you into the full, precise, correct knowledge that comes out of revelation through an intimate relationship with the tree of life, Jesus Christ himself. And that's the challenge to us. That's the challenge to the church, especially in the Western world, who is so mental and so... so and, and again, don't under, misunderstand what I'm saying. The mind has a very important role to play, but it, the mind is meant to be the servant of your spirit, not to be the leader. Most of the American church, the mind is the leader. The soul is the leader. What we reason and how we think and how we determine based on logical thinking is how we live. And that is the life source of probably 90 to 95% of the church is soulish in their expression and how they live and the life source they, they live from. And they think that the accumulation of knowledge is the same thing as having revelation experiential that comes out of intimacy with Jesus Christ. So I just wanted to alert us to that, is that we would not make that mistake. Amen? Because we want to have, to have ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying and to bear that 100-fold fruit that, that we want to bear to have that is we must move beyond. This, this, these lessons, these teachings must move beyond mental knowledge into relational experience that comes by the Lord himself revealing to you what it means. Okay, so, amen. Okay, so Quentin, we'll go ahead and show the diagram here. So, showing? Okay. So we're going to just quickly review this diagram. I think a lot, I've had a lot of feedback from people, and I think it's really helping people. That Just a quick review. In, in session one, we looked at the body, all right? The body, Paul said, the body is a body of sin and death, that lust is in our body, that the body is not going to be redeemed until the resurrection of the dead, but there, there is sin in the body. Now, that does not make the body itself evil. It means that sin in the body is evil. Then we've got the soul, which is the you. You are 
a soul. You are a mind, will, and emotions. You have a personality. You know that. It, you know, you're, what you like, what you don't like uh, is your soul, is your mind, your will, and emotions. And your soul is a processor, an executor, an expressor of whether that, that, li- that input's coming from the outside in and from the inside out. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions, your personality. The deepest part of your soul is your heart. The heart and the soul are different, but yet, but yet uh, similar. But uh, the, the heart and the soul are distinct. And so the, the heart is the deepest place in your soul. It contains your deepest feelings, your deepest beliefs, your deepest aspirations, your deepest motivations. Those deep, deep desires are here in your heart, and you're in your heart. Now, even to the, to the deepest place of you, which Jesus described as the innermost man, from the innermost being will flow rivers of living water. That innermost man is called the spirit. And so Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5.23 that we are spirit, soul, and body. And in saying that we're spirit, soul, and body, Paul was saying spirit must be first, soul must be second, body must be third. If we get that out of divine order, we will be soulish or carnal. We will be soulish and carnal Christians instead of spiritual Christians. And much of the church... Even, even good people are still living from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, still living from the soul and the power of the soul, rather than from that inward, that deep, deep place in you where the Holy Spirit dwells. That was, uh, that's the review of session one. Your spirit is the most important part of your entire being. Your spirit is the place where God dwells. And God's goal is for the Spirit of God to, be, to strengthen your spirit, your innermost man, so that the life of God would flow out of your spirit into your heart. Because whatever life, whatever, whoever occupies your heart, and we sing a lot about that in, in church and worship, whatever occupies your heart, that deep, deep place in your soul, whoever occupies that, whether Christ or self, will be the life source that you live by. If self is the life source, if self is occupying the throne of your heart, I want what I want, when I want it, and how I want it. That's my simple definition of the self-life. I want what I want, when I want it, how I want it. That's what the self-life is. If, if I'm living by that, that life source, then I'm going to produce naturally the fruit of that life, which is the deeds of the flesh, which Paul described in Galatians chapter 5. But if I'm, if I'm surrendering that self-life and I'm saying, Christ, come into my heart and be the Lord of my heart, be the Lord of my, of my heart, be the life source that I live by, then it will be Christ who's, who lives rather than you. And so that's kind of the, the dynamic we've, we've looked at. We looked at the spirit, the soul, the heart, the body. We looked in, last, last Sunday we looked at the indwelling Holy Spirit, that inside of you is not an it or an influence or oil or a dove or fire, though he can manifest in those ways. Inside of you is a real person, the third person of the Trinity. I mean, think about that. That is amazing. We, we tend to think like, okay, the Holy Spirit's an it, an influence, and we don't realize, no, God himself, God is in you. Christ is in you. That the revelation that we need, Christ is in you. Christ is in you. That that God himself, the third person of the Trinity, dwells in your human spirit. That means you can have a holy of holies relationship with the Holy Spirit. And, you know, to borrow the word I used last Sunday, that's stunning. (laughs) That's simply incredible stunning. That we can have that. Now, in this session, what we're going to do is we're going we're to drill into that diagram just a little bit more. And we're going we're gonna to look at now, not only do you have a human spirit, and not only does the Holy Spirit dwell inside of you, but your human spirit and the Holy Spirit are now one. You are, you are connected to the Holy Spirit. You are joined to the Holy Spirit. So let's start with Scripture. Let's start with 
1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. And again, just it, it's just when, when these things move beyond the mind into the heart and become revelation, it will change your life. It really will change your life. But Paul is writing in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Paul says, but talking about those who turn to the Lord, he says, but the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. I want you to pause right there and just think about that for a minute. When you turn to the Lord and you're born again, and he's talking, he doesn't, when you, when you turn from your sins and you're born again, when you, if, you, if you truly have been born of the Spirit of God, listen, you are one spirit with him. You, you are connected spirit to spirit. You cannot be unconnected. You're connected. No matter what you feel like, no matter the day you're having, no matter if you feel a million miles away from God, you are one spirit with him. You are joined to the Holy Spirit, connected, grafted. And I'm just going to drill this into, into us. We need this so, so bad. It's so important. I want to read another scripture, Romans 6, verse 5. Paul says that if we have become united with him, in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. And I'm going to, I'm going to go into that scripture. That scripture is, is extremely rich. And we're going to go into that in a minute, just in a lot more detail. But I just want to set this context here of where we're going. Now go over one chapter to Romans chapter 7, verse 4, where Paul says that, he says, Therefore, my brethren... You also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ so that you might be joined to another. Catch that again, that joining together. And now, where does that joining together? If you go back to that diagram, that, that, you don't have to show it, but if, if it's not showing. But that joining together is that deep place in your innermost being. That deep place in your innermost being, you have been joined together with Christ. It's past tense. It has been done. It has been finished. When what Jesus finished for you on the cross and what the Holy Spirit finished in your spirit when you were born again, it has been finished. You are joined one spirit to him. I'm glad everyone is excited about that. So that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. Now, here's the way I like to think about this, this really this, this joining together, this grafting together. And I, I've shared this story. Most of you know the story. I'm going to share it because a lot of the online viewers don't know the story. But in 1991, I was in a water skiing accident. And it was, uh, it was actually the precursor to wakeboarding. It was called scurfing. And we... We had all, all of my friends, this is back when I was still uh, in the party scene, trying to come out of it, but not really trying too hard. And we were going to have this big lake party that night, and we had a um, bunch of people there and people coming in and stuff like that. And, you know, we had a boat full of people, and we were, we were trying to do some tricks on the scurfer. And one of the things I was trying to do was, was trying to wrap the rope around my waist go outside the wake and then jump the wake and then, you know, in midair, twist around and do a 360 and land. And this one time I did it, the rope, the end of the rope got caught in the corner of the rope. And when I fell, the slack in the rope pulled by about, you know, my thumb, thumb off. And so if I didn't have a life jacket on, I would have drowned. I, would have, I looked down and, you know, it's just the shock of the lifetime. When you look down and all you see is bone and blood you know, bones sticking out and blood gushing. And so, you know, it was just like, I mean, I would have drowned without a life jacket. So they rushed me to the hospital and they have to do, uh, obviously, emergency surgery. You know, one of the things the doctor said, I, I, I still can't even fathom what this doctor was thinking, I guess. But he said, you know, one option we have, and I'm 18 years old, one thing, one option we have 
is we can actually cut off your big toe. And he thought this was a good idea. Cut off your big toe and sew it to your thumb. I'm like, I'm like, I mean, I was on morphine. I, I, I was on enough morphine, but even on morphine to, to take away the pain, I had enough sense to go, okay, wait, wait. You want me to go around with a, with a big toe <laughs> sewed onto my thumb? I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> I'm like, I appreciate the fact you want to help me, but that, that is not good. But one of the things they did have to do is they had to, they had to take some skin from my hip area, or they had to take some skin from this, this index finger and sew it around my thumb, and then they had to take some skin from my hip area and sew it to my index finger. So they, it was called a skin graft, as you probably know. And you know, if you, if you look at it, you can definitely tell, okay, that definitely does not look like natural skin. In fact, uh, when I, if I, if I'm, especially when I was in high school and I was out in the sun a lot, this part of my, my finger would get like dark brown and the rest of my hand would, you know, not. So it looked like I had a piece of liver on my finger. One of my high school friends was like, hey, man, looks like you got a piece of liver on your finger. You know, it's like totally terrible for your self-esteem. But my point in saying that is I can look down now and see this piece of skin grafted onto my finger is a visible representation of what it looks like for the Holy Spirit to be grafted to my human spirit. The Holy Spirit has been grafted to your human spirit, just like a skin graft, just God taking the, the unnatural, our human spirit, and grafting in the natural to it so that now the very Spirit of God is grafted to your human spirit. Amen. It is incredible. You are one spirit with him. And when the truth of this verse becomes your personal revelation, it will transform your life. I mean, this is the one thing I think about, try to think about every day is my spirit is joined to the Holy Spirit. My spirit is one spirit with him. The spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead has been grafted to my human spirit. I am one spirit with him. Now, I just want to read a couple slides here. You, Mackenzie, you can show those. I just want to just ponder this for a second because this is very important. Is you can experience spiritual growth because the indwelling spirit has been grafted to your spirit. Your life can be fruitful because the spirit has been fastened to your spirit. If you feel like, okay, I'm struggling here. I'm struggling to produce fruit. I'm still going around the mountain of the issues I had five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 50 years ago, the lust issue, the anger issue, the rebellion issue, the judgment issue, the jealousy issue, whatever, the insecurity issue, whatever that, those issues are, and you feel like, okay, I just feel like I can't grow. Well, here is the key to your growth right here, is your spiritual growth, you can experience spiritual growth because the indwelling spirit has been grafted to your spirit. Your life can be fruitful because the spirit has been fastened to your spirit. Show the next slide. Next is, you know, we talked about the abiding life in John 15, 1 through 11, but you are connected to Christ the vine through your spiritual union with the indwelling spirit. This means you have a direct pipeline to his life. You have a direct pipeline to his life. The sap that runs from the vine, Christ, who now dwells in your spirit, it is a direct pipeline. Pipeline. There, there, is no, there, there is no hindrance to, in your spirit from, from the life of Christ that is now connected and grafted to your human spirit. There is no hindrance for the transmission of his life and victory and authority and nature and life and resurrection. There is his holiness, his righteousness. There is no hindrance there in your spirit. Now, there are hindrances in your soul, in your body. We're going to talk about those next, next week. But there, in your spirit, there is no hindrances. That means you have a direct pipeline to his life. His life can flow through you, meaning you can bear fruit. And see, when we don't know that, what happens is we spin our wheels and we go nowhere because we don't know, okay, now actually inside of me, 
My spirit and the Holy Spirit are one, joined together, fastened together. Slide number three. You are always connected to him. I want you to catch this. You're always connected to him. Whether you feel it or not. I used to say all the time, all the time. I mean, almost every day. Oh, I'm a million miles away from God. I'm so dry and dead. And I'm just, I just feel like God's a million miles away. You know, Jesus, I, Jesus who? You know, Jesus Christ. And I'm just like, yeah, I just feel a million, million miles away from the Lord. Like he's like, you know, I just feel dead, dry. And the Lord just corrected me. And said, no, those are just feelings. Those feelings are lying to you. Those feelings are like the, the, your, the dashboard of your car that's telling you your engine light is on or telling you you're low on gas or telling you you're low on oil. Those are just the, those feelings when you feel, I feel far from him. I feel disconnected from him. Those are just feelings. And the, the, that's telling you, like the dashboard on your car, that's telling you who is actually leading and governing your life. It's not the spirit when you feel that way. It's the soul. It's the feelings and the emotions of the soul. Now, that does not mean you don't ever go through wilderness experiences or dry times or times when God's not speaking, all that. You, you, there's definitely times when God's silent, when God's not speaking, but the truth is you are always, always, always connected to Christ spirit to spirit. He is not far from you. He's closer than your skin. Tell your emotions, shut up, <laughs> renew your mind to the truth. Let faith rise up and, and say, you know what, emotions, you are lying to me. The truth is my spirit and the Holy Spirit are one. My spirit could not be closer than it already is. I am connected to Christ, and no one can break or sever that connection. Now, that connection can be suppressed, oppressed by soulish living, carnal living, but that connection is always there. You don't have to strive to try to be connected. You're connected. You don't have to strive to abide you are connected. What you need is to realize it and for faith to rise up. See, what the problem is, is unbelief. The problem is doubt and unbelief. You don't believe it because you feel a certain way. But, but the mind has to be renewed to the truth of the accomplished fact of the reality that your spirit is one spirit with the Holy Spirit. Your mind has to come into this place of renewal where the very revelation that Paul wrote about when he wrote 1 Corinthians 6, 17, and it was his revelation he put on paper, that revelation now that he wrote becomes written on your heart through meditation, and the very revelation Paul had now becomes personalized in you, which is what, this, what meditation is meant to be, so that Paul's revelation is now your own revelation, and you realize faith rises up, unbelief goes away, and the, the faith of what the scriptures say about you, it's like looking in a mirror, what the scriptures say about you, you are one spirit with him, no matter what your emotions are saying to you, no matter how you feel, your mind must be renewed to the truth of what God's word says about you. He's grafted to you. He's one spirit with you. You cannot be, you know, you, you cannot, even though you feel a million miles away, now, if you're living in sin, you need to repent. You need to confess your sins. You need to return back to God. You need to ask God to cover your sins with the blood of Jesus and turn back to him. Now, if you're living in, in selfishly, if you're living in sin, you need to turn back to him. Now, I'm not in any way saying this is a, a, an excuse to do what you want to do in the flesh by no means. What I'm saying is that, is that the, the soul, you know, even, even today when we were worshiping, I was like, and this happened so much before I speak, I feel... I feel as if I'm a million miles away. I, I was like, God, I feel, and it's like, shut up. <laughs> Stop going by how you feel. The truth is you are one spirit with him. 
When you wake up and you haven't had your coffee yet and it feels as if all the negative things are bombarding your mind, the truth is I am, you are one spirit with him. You don't have to go here, there, and everywhere to try to meet God. Now, obviously, God will send you places. I'm not saying that, but you can commune with him by going here. You can, you can meet with him every day, the God of all creation, because your spirit is joined to him. So back to slide three. You are always connected to him, whether you feel it or not. Therefore, you can know him intimately. I want you to catch this. More deeply than you know anyone else. Do you realize you have that ability in you? You can know the Lord even deeper than you know your spouse, your children, your parents. I mean, they're external. He's internal. You have that ability. You have that potential to know the Lord intimately more than you know anyone else because of that connection. Because of that connection you have with Christ who is the vine, the sap of his life from the vine, the life source can flow out of you into your spirit because there's a direct pipeline to his life and the life of the spirit can be released outward into your heart and your soul, your emotions and your body. Slide four is your spirit-to-spirit -spirit connection to the indwelling spirit is the linchpin, or you could say the critical component to producing Christ-like fruit. If you want to produce Christ-like fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, if you want to produce Christ-like fruit, it happens from this connection. It happens from this spirit-to-spirit -spirit connection. Your spirit joined to Christ is how you produce fruit. It, now, there, there's hindrances that must be pruned away. There's work that must be done because the soul can block it, obviously. We'll talk about that next week. But that connection there is the key to producing fruit. As his divine life flows directly into your spirit... Because, again, there's no hindrance. There is no hindrance in your spirit. It's a, it's a direct connection to the Holy Spirit. As his divine life flows directly into your, into your spirit, his life can then flow like sap into your heart, your soul, your body, making you that fruitful branch Jesus talked about in John 15, 1 through 11. You can be that fruitful branch that bears fruit, more fruit, much fruit, and fruit that remains because the sap of his divine, indestructible, zoe life can flow out of your spirit into your heart, and then he can fill you and produce that life. You have, here's what I want to drill into us. You have everything you need for life and godliness. You don't need anything else. I'm not saying there's not times for impartation. I'm not saying there's not times for additional baptisms of the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying any of that. But Peter said, you have everything you need for life and godliness right here in your spirit. The problem is your soul. The problem is your self-life. And all of us are, yeah, I know. The problem is your flesh. But I'm saying, I'm trying to drill into us that we have everything we need for life and godliness. All the love you need to love like God and love, to love God and love others is right here in you. All the peace you need to overcome anxiety and worry is right here in you. All the joy you need to overcome a gloomy, depressed heart is right here in you. All the faith you need to overcome doubt and unbelief is right here in you. All the self-control you need to live a disciplined life is right here in you. All of that is in you because Christ is in you, because he's joined one spirit to, to, to you. He's one spirit with you. Now, let's, let's turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. 
when Paul is talking about you are one spirit with him, with, with the Lord, it, it's so interesting here that, that Paul quotes the, mo the most famous scripture about marriage on the preceding verse. And he says, he's talking about don't be joined to a prostitute, but he says, he says here, quoting Genesis 2.24, the two shall become one flesh. What marriage does in the physical, the natural, the born again experience is what God did of joining you to the heavenly bridegroom, spirit to spirit. The two shall become one flesh in the natural. The two shall become one spirit in the spiritual. Back to that, that verse, the Greek word here for, for join means to glue together, cement, fasten together. It conveys to join or fasten firmly together, to join oneself to, cleave to. See, just as marriage glues a man and a woman together for life, when you are born again, you are glued to the Spirit of God. He's fastened to you. He's, he's uh, grafted to you. You cannot be separated from him. You are glued together for life to the Holy Spirit. He is not far from you. He's closer to you than your skin. You know, a lot of times, I think Dad used to do this analogy of marriage. He was like, now, just imagine you have two pieces of construction paper. You take one piece of construction paper and you take another, and you coat one piece of construction paper with, a, with this, a tons of glue, and you glue it to the other piece of construction paper. And then once the glue dries and sticks, you try to rip off that other piece of construction paper. You can't rip off that piece of construction paper without tearing the other piece because they're glued together. That's what marriage is like. That's what being born again is like. You're glued together. You're fastened. You're grafted into Christ. Christ is grafted into you. Just think about this for a second. Have you ever spent time thinking about 10 minutes just meditating on the fact your human spirit grafted to the Holy Spirit, the very spirit that hovered over creation and created the sun and the universe, that created the stars, that created everything we see, the earth and all its beauty, the Holy Spirit that is now fastened to your spirit created this in response to the words of Jesus. If you, if you study out the scriptures. Now, the one who created the universe is fastened, joined, glued to, grafted to your human spirit. See, again, what blocks that is the mind. Limitations in thinking. Doubt and unbelief. Just, you know... Even low self-esteem, I'm unworthy, I'm not worthy of this, I'm not worthy of that. The creator of the entire universe who created everything we see, the Milky Way, the galaxies, the sun, the moon, the stars, the creator of the universe is grafted to your spirit. I mean, that, that's incredible. <laughs> Think about just... Just spend, my, my challenge to you is spend 10 minutes, several days a week, just meditating on the one who is joined to your spirit and just see if that doesn't change your life. When your mind is renewed to the truth of what's, of what's true in you, if you're born again, it will transform your life. In fact, when Paul's writing in Romans chapter 12, he says, be transformed by the renewing of your, of your mind that word is metamorphosu, metamorphu, which means transformation, renewal, just like this metamorphosis takes place, you will experience change from one state to another, from a carnal, soulless state to a spiritual state when you renew your mind to the truth that the Creator is now fastened, joined, and grafted to my human spirit 
and I can't be closer to him than I am. Now, he needs to be released from you, of course, but I, I try to, I don't, I don't do this every day, but I try to, and I would encourage you to try to every day if you can. This is what I try to say in prayer is I have been joined to Christ and I am one spirit with him. When I wake up and I'm in a funk and I wake up and I'm just, my flesh is ruling, my mind is in control, the soul is living, the coffee hasn't yet kicked in, I say, I am joined to Christ and I am one spirit with him. Just say it. You, you know, don't just, you, you, when it comes to meditation, meditation is much more than just thinking it. You got to voice it. You got you to speak it out loud or you have to write it down for, it to, for meditation to work. If you just try to think it, it doesn't work. Even in, going back into the Hebrew, is, is an active, uh, voiced out uh, confession. Is that you've got to confess it. You've got to speak it out loud. You've got to, you know, what I've found is you can either speak it out loud or write it down. I write it down because I don't want to wake up my family. But I have been joined to Christ and I am one spirit with him. And, and let me just say this. What we're going to find out in this class is what breathing is to living in the natural, prayer and meditation is to living in the spirit. You can't live in the spirit, you can't walk in the spirit. You cannot live from Christ in you if you don't learn to meditate in prayer. And we're going to have a whole session on that. But say it, out, say it out loud. The indwelling spirit who raised Jesus from the dead has been grafted to my spirit. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, is fastened to my spirit. I am, I am inseparably connected to the same spirit poured out on the day of Pentecost who still does miracles and raises the dead and cleanses the lepers. You're connected to him. The same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead. It's good news, isn't it? It's life-changing, life-changing. But again, I, we, were, we had our Zoom call yesterday, and one of, the, um, one of the ladies on the call was sharing, you know, I learned these things many, many years ago. But she said, the one thing I didn't do is I didn't, cre I didn't create, I didn't take these scriptures and these truths and turn them into prayerful meditations. And because of that, I lost to some degree what I learned many, many years ago. The warning is, if you don't get this into your prayer life, if you don't get this into your prayer life, you will lose it. You will be a forgetful hearer rather than an effectual doer. I, I, I know that. I've been, it's true in my life. If you don't, and my challenge would be to you, try to, to, to go through each session and take the scriptures, take the principles, take the lessons, and create your own prayer guide that you can use in your own prayer time with the Lord so that you can get it into your normal routine of prayer because that is how you're going to hold on to this. If you, don't, if you don't do that, I'm telling you, if you don't do that, you'll just be like what I quoted in the very beginning of the, of the message. You'll learn, but never come into the relational, experiential knowledge of the truth. It'll just go in one ear and out the other. And you'll remember years later, oh yeah, that, that series about indwelling life. And you wasted 15 years because it didn't get into your prayer life. When it gets into your prayer life, these truths get into your prayer life, your prayer life will be something you look forward to rather than dread. <laughs> A lot of times people dread prayer because it's just basically transactional. God, heal this person. God, do this. God, do this. God, help me with this. Help me with that. It's just all transactional. God, do, do, do. Instead of a relationship. But when you get it into this relational prayer life and it's meditation and who God is in you and re the renewing of your mind, I'm telling you, prayer becomes like a dining experience of joy and pleasure. It, it's, you, will, you will, I mean, it will be the, the highlight of your entire day of that dining experience with Christ who now dwells in you. Romans 6, 5. I read it at the beginning, but I just want to read it again. But we want to, we want to drill into what this, uh, the, the richness of this. Because if you just read this verse, you won't really capture the fullness of what God or what Paul was communicating by the Holy Spirit. For if we have become 
united with him. I want you to just pause right there. United with him in the likeness of his death, certainly will also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Now, this Greek word for united, it means, this is where, this is where if you just read it just straight from the Bible, you'll miss out so much of the richness. This Greek word means born together with, of joint origin, connate, innate, implanted by birth or nature, grown together, united with, kindred. All that is what it means for you with him. This word is derived from a word that means to make, to grow together. And it has the idea of being planted together and growing along with. So if you take some of these definitions and you substitute it in, here's what it means. You have, when you were born again, you have been born together with Christ. You are now growing together with Christ. You are of joint origin with Christ. That means whatever is true of Christ, because of the spirit-to-spirit union you now have, and because you are in Christ and you are baptized into his body, whatever is true of Christ, of his origin, and I mean like his death, resurrection, ascension, and enthronement. Whatever is true of Christ is now true of you. You have died when you were born again. You've been resurrected. You have been ascended. You have been, you have been seated with Christ in heavenly places because you are of joint origin with Christ. You have Christ's nature implanted into you by new birth. You are a partaker. This is what this means. You are a partaker of the divine nature. Not when you get to heaven now. That doesn't make you a God, but it makes you godly. You are a partaker of the divine nature. The divine nature of the Son of God has been grafted to your human spirit. You are now that partaker of the divine nature. You are not like those of the Adamic creation. Those you work with that are not born of the Spirit, your family that are not born of the Spirit, they're not like you. That means you are a partaker of the divine nature. If you forget it or if you don't believe it, it does nothing to you. You'll still be soulish and carnal, unfortunately. But if you tap into the treasure you have because of Christ... You will be a multi-billionaire, spiritually speaking. You are that because you have Christ in you. You are a partaker of the divine nature of Jesus Christ. Incredible. Incredible. Let's look at Romans chapter 8, verse 10. If Christ is in you, and if you're, I'm reading from the New American Standard, which, by the way, I believe is the best interpretation of this verse. So if you don't have this, this translation, it's going to read differently. I believe this, it just, and I, you know, have studied it for a long time. I believe this is the best translation of this verse. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, that's what Paul's talking about, that body is dead because of sin. Lust is raging in your body. Yet the spirit, your human spirit, notice the lowercase, your human spirit is alive because of righteousness. See, you have everything you need for life and godliness. It's already inside of you. You are a partaker of the divine nature of Jesus Christ. Everything you need is now in you, has been grafted to you. Life you did not possess is now grafted into you. 
Righteousness you did not possess is now grafted into you. Holiness that you did not possess is now grafted into you. Victory that you did not possess is now grafted into you. The very nature of Jesus Christ, his love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and kindness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control, now grafted into you because the indwelling spirit is now joined to your, holy, to your human spirit. You have everything you need for life and godliness because you're a partaker of the divine nature. And the, 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 the key is learning to live by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ is learning how to draw out, how to draw out from the well of salvation. Isaiah 12 talks about you will, you will joyously draw from the wells of salvation. When you, and, and when Jesus was talking to the woman at the well, he says, he says, you don't even understand the life. Or he said, you don't even understand who's talking to you. This well of water is, I'm paraphrasing, but it's basically symbolic of the water for those who would believe in me that inside of you is a well that runs so deep it never ends because the life-giving Son of God is, is grafted to your human spirit and we need to learn how to draw out that water that's in that innermost place so it permeates and fills every part of our being. See, you do not have to struggle to abide in Christ. If abiding in Christ is a struggle and it's confusing, you don't have to struggle anymore. You merely have to believe and renew your mind to the truth that if you're born of the Spirit, Christ is grafted to you. You don't have to struggle anymore with whatever it is. You don't have to go around another mountain. You don't have to live in the soul. Those issues in your heart don't have to rule you. Those issues in your soul, the strongholds in your mind, they don't have to rule you. The conqueror, the overcomer, the one who overcame death, hell, and the grave is the overcomer in you, and he can overcome in you and through you. You don't have to live in defeat by the flesh or the devil any longer. You don't have to live in defeat from your past and all the failures. You don't have to live in, in that constant spinning your wheels and going nowhere, struggling in the same issues you've struggled with for 15 years. Christ in you is the difference maker. So the key to the abiding life that we're talking about, John 15, 1 through 11, that key to the abiding life is having a revelation that you already are united, joined, and connected to Christ's spirit. You think about it, the, the, the analogy that Jesus used of the vine and the branches. He said, abide in me and I in you. Apart from me, you can do nothing. That You think about just the natural parable, the analogy Jesus gave is the vine is the life source and the vine, through the vine, when the branch is just connected to the vine, the sap of that life that's in that vine flows through the branch and the branch, the only responsibility of the branch is to stay connected. The sap does all of the work. The sap does all of the fruit producing. You don't produce the fruit, you stay connected. You remove the hindrances. You remove those things that are stunting growth through God's help. But that sap that has the lifeblood in it, the lifeblood of the plant that flows through the branch to produce fruit, the, the fruit comes out of the life. That life is now in you because you're connected spirit to spirit. The sap to produce the fruit is now, is now in you operating and flowing to produce that fruit. You really can be, you really can be the fruitful branch Jesus talked about. Okay, now we're about to go even deeper. <laughs> is your connection, because you have the indwelling Holy Spirit inside of you, because your spirit is now connected spirit to spirit to the same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead and created the universe. You have this umbilical cord-like connection 
to God the Father and God the Son in heaven. Think about that. That is, I'm going to explain this in Scripture in a minute, but just think about this. Jesus Christ enthroned in heaven, the Father enthroned in heaven, you are connected like an umbilical cord, spiritual umbilical cord, in your spirit to God in heaven. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 is what Paul is describing there. Because you have the Holy Spirit, you have access to the mind of Christ. It's amazing that your spirit-to-spirit -spirit connection with the Holy Spirit means you're connected to the throne. And as Paul says in there, you can know the, 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 the depths of God. You can know the deep things of God. You don't have to wait until you die and go to heaven. Those things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard does not have to wait until the sweet by and by when you die. Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, you can experience this now because the Holy Spirit is in you. And the Holy Spirit who is in you speaks to you spirit to spirit, transmitting his thoughts directly to your spirit, giving you revelation of the very depths of God. Depths of God who, who is enthroned in heaven. You can have that revelation. That, that is incredible. Everything that has been hidden is now being made known to those who have ears to hear. You have access to uh, 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 Ephesians 2.18. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. The Father who is enthroned in heaven, you have a, you, because of the Holy Spirit, you have access to him. There's a spiritual connection between the indwelling spirit, your spirit, and God who dwells in heaven. As you can really know the thoughts of the Father and the Son in heaven through this spiritual connection that you have. When you read Revelation 4 and Revelation 5 and you see the worship that's going around the throne of God and the angels are bowing down in worship and saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. And you see the lamb takes the scroll and breaks the seals and he's, he's called the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of the offspring of David. You have spiritual access to that very place that you can receive deep revelation. And I'm, I'm speaking about that, and I'm like, okay, I, I think I, I need to develop that part. That's, that's part of this. So I'm like, I see it in Scripture. I, I'm like a very immature kid learning to walk as it relates to this, but it's available. May the Lord show us how to, to, to live in this reality that you have access to the mind of Christ. God in heaven the revelation of God in heaven, the, the, the deep things of God in heaven, eye has not seen, ear has not heard. God, Paul said, he reveals these things to you now, not when you die, now, because you have the Holy Spirit. And he communicates them, if you read it, he communicates, if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he communicates it spirit to spirit, the joining of spirit to spirit. Those, the Holy Spirit transmitting his thoughts directly to your human spirit, and then you know by this divine knowing, you know by this intuition, the revelation of the Holy Spirit to your human spirit, the mind of Christ. Just like you can know your own thoughts, and you can know your own thoughts and what you're thinking, is you can actually know what God is thinking. That's what 1 Corinthians 2 is all about. Read it, read it. You can know what God is thinking. 
You can know what God is thinking about a situation in the world. You can know what God is thinking about what's going on in the country. You can know what God is thinking about your job. You can know what God is thinking about your family or a certain issue. Whatever it is, you have access to the mind of Christ right here. Spiritually, in that connection, that umbilical cord connection to the Father and the Son in heaven, you have that access right now to know what the Father and the Son are presently thinking. See, don't you think we should be people of great revelation? That's why Paul said, the spiritual man discerns all things. The one who's spiritual, the one whose spirit is strong, the one, who, the one whose spirit is now living from that divine union of connection, we can look at any situation if we're, if we're spiritual and the soul is subdued to the spirit and the flesh is subdued to the spirit. We can look at any situation and we can, set, we can discern accurately and judge accurately with God's very own thoughts in a manner because we have the mind of Christ. It's pretty awesome. Don't you think we've been living far, beyond, far below what God has given us? So I'm just going to close here with just some application. I want to challenge you to not be a forgetful hearer. Okay, just think about the way you feel right now, okay? Hopefully you feel good. Raise your hand if you don't. No, I'm just kidding. No, I don't want to hear it. But hopefully you feel good. The reason, okay, here's the reason you feel good right now. Your mind has just been renewed. Faith has now risen up in your heart. What has always been true is now true to you in this very given moment. You know what? You can live like this every single moment of every single day if you want. You can start your day this way, not by listening to me, but by learning how to pray in a certain way. By learning how to speak what's true and confess what's true until the mind hears it. Faith comes by hearing. See, see what's happened in this dynamic I'm assuming for the ones that I can tell some have really been touched. Some are still kind of seem like you didn't get enough sleep last night. But some have really been touched, and I can see that. What's happening is faith is rising up in your heart because the, the truth is being spoken. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Well, if you learn to pray a certain way, then you can actually experience this yourself. You can be your favorite preacher and learn how to renew your mind by confessing these things out loud or in, you know, writing down, however... And, and hearing the word brings faith, and faith is what activates the life of God in you. When you don't believe what is true about you, God can't move. When you don't know or don't believe all that I've just shared, if you don't believe that, that God can't move, God's limited by your unbelief. God's limited by your ignorance. God's limited by you not knowing these things. But when faith rises up, it actually begins to activate the reality of what's true on the inside of you so you can now live from this. You can now live, produce the fruit, commune with God, know the deep things in God's heart. So the application is take, take what I've said and begin to create your own prayer guide uh, of notes you make so you can go back to this and you can get it into your prayer life. You can get it into your walk. You can get it into your life. Because if you don't, you'll lose it. But, you know, spend some time in prayer. I've got some application in here. Spend some time in prayer meditating upon your spirit-to-spirit -spirit union with Christ. Again, meditation is not a passive thinking where you're just quietly thinking. That's not meditation, biblical meditation. Biblical meditation is voiced. Whether you sing it, whether you speak it, whether you write it, it must be confessed. It must be expressed. It can't just be thought because the engagement of the heart and the mind together requires the voicing of the truth. And so begin in prayer to, to, to say what I said earlier. I've been joined, and I've got in the notes. You can just go back and look at it. But I've been joined to Christ, and I'm one spirit with him. I, in fact, I would just encourage you, get the notes and, and do the application. I've been joined to Christ, and I'm one spirit with him. Confess that over your life. Speak it over your life. Sing it if you're a singer. I'm not a singer, but if you're a singer, I mean, I am a singer, but I'm a bad singer. But if you're a good singer, I guess you can make a joyful noise to the Lord. But sing it, speak it, pray it, write it, whatever works for you. 
Okay, so, so just in the notes, you can get that. In prayer, say out loud, uh, I've been born together with Christ. I am growing together with Christ. I am, I am of joint origin with Christ. I have Christ's nature implanted into me. Christ's divine nature is now part of my spirit. See, say it out loud, write it out, or sing it. Just confess it until you actually, your mind's renewed and your faith is activated and the reality of what's true in you is released. Number, the next one is say out loud or write in a notebook or sing it or whatever. Life I did not possess is now grafted into me. Righteousness I did not possess is now grafted into me. Holiness I did not possess is now grafted into me. Victory I did not possess. Got a whole list of things. Just begin praying that way. And even though the Lord is like, yeah, I know all that, it, it, it's about you getting to that place of renewal, getting to that place of faith, getting to that place of revelation, getting to that place where truth is working in you. So what's true about you is in alignment with your soul, with your mind. And here's the one where I'm, I really need to grow in, is in prayer. Begin cultivating your access to the Father and the Son in the heavenly throne room. Ask the Lord to bring you spiritually into heaven's throne room through your spirit-to-spirit -spirit union with the indwelling spirit. Ask the Lord to reveal the deep things in his heart to your spirit, whatever his passions and mysteries and burdens, and write down what he reveals to you. See, this is a school you never graduate from. I, I, we never, ever graduate from the school of indwelling life. We're always going deeper. We're always going deeper. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, I just thank you for the incredible, the incredible gift you've given us, the, the Son of God, his life, his very life transmitted into us. Lord, it's just... It's mind-blowing. It is almost like, is this really true? Yes, it is true. But it's just so, we've been so deceived by religion. Lord, the treasure in us has been buried by religion. Lord, I ask you, Lord, to unearth the treasure in us by revelation. Lord, I pray that the, the incredible reality that I'm, con I'm, I'm always connected to you. Let it go into our hearts in an ever deeper way. And Lord, I just pray, may we know Christ, like I said earlier, better than we know anyone else. Lord, we want to know you better than we know anyone else. And may we love you more than we love anyone else. I pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us online. Have an awesome week. All right. So got the old thumbs up. So we are done. So remember the tithe and the offering in the back there in that bucket. Um, remember the golf tournament Friday.